Hi everyone. This is an operations calling session on extending Tulip with low code. Quick introduction. My name is Dylan Forsese. I run technology partnerships and strategy at Tulip. And I am Sarah Taylor. I'm an engineer at Tulip and I run the apps team. All right. So let's talk about Tulip and low code. Uh, what is low code? So I think that low code requires basic knowledge to implement a solution. So beyond if else, if you know what JSON is, if you know what port HTTP uses, then low code is something within your wheelhouse. Uh, an example I've seen a lot lately, if you can use chat GPT to write a SQL statement and you know what prompt to use to get a result that works, then low code tools are definitely for you. When do you use low code? For a majority of solution building, no code is the right choice to enable citizen development. Uh, but low code is great for solutions with high complexity and low repeatability. This is the stuff that's at the bottom of the funnel for a platform to support. Low code allows users to extend the functionality of the platform and allows power users to create immense value while allowing core developers to focus on the big problems and saving the platform from a lot of bloat. In the following presentation, uh, we will detail low-code and no-code functionality at Tulip that's aimed at both extending the functionality of Tulip and helping to integrate it into your existing systems. And an important thing to note that it's very likely that some of the more generalizable functions that we're going to demo today, uh, they may become product features in the future. All right. So one of the first pieces of low-code at Tulip we want to cover today is custom widgets. So just like how in the Tulip app editor, you can have normal widgets. These are your buttons, your inputs, your interactive tables. Maybe it's just some plain text. Custom widgets are pretty similar, except for instead of Tulip and our engineering team writing the widget, testing its functionality and its visualization, we offer a framework for you to do that in your Tulip solutions. So custom widgets, they allow you to input things from the app editor via something we call props and then emit events back via callbacks and we call these events um, and these are highly customizable you can pretty much configure them however you wish and it really opens up a lot of functionality for you as an app builder more specifically you can edit and build custom widgets via a page in the um, account settings. When you go to that page, you'll see essentially four main quadrants of how to build a custom widget. These are sort of designed to let you customize and build your HTML, your JavaScript, and your CSS. So when you see the page, the top will be the widgets, props, and events. This is how your app will interact with the widgets. And then the bottom left is this quadrant for you to write the low code of the custom widget. Um, this is how it looks, how it operates. In the right side, it allows you to test it. You can visualize the preview of the widget you've just written, as well as have some log statements if you're debugging through its functionality. So how you add custom widgets to apps through the app editor is through a special dropdown that will appear if you have at least one custom widget added to your workspace. Uh, you can pick the name of it and then it will render the same way any other widget does. And on the right panel for widget configuration, this is where you would add the inputs called props or configure any sort of events. This would be an example. Maybe you want to, if you do something on the custom widget, emit a trigger and have that pop up. And that's where you would configure it on the right side panel. The way custom widgets work under the hood is they're rendered within an HTML iframe. Um, this is an HTML element that loads another HTML page within your document um, to render and execute the HTML and CSS and JavaScript. Since we rolled out custom widgets, we noticed that there's three main use cases that customers really adopted um, when, when they were interacting with the feature. The first one is product enhancements. The second being stop gaps with the platform. And the third being really what we envision custom widgets to be, which is uniquely custom logic um, that you can really make your own. So let's go through each of those. The first one, product enhancements. Uh, many custom widgets sort of build upon what we already offer in Tulip. For example, we have a button widget. You can configure it. You can change its color. You can change its text. 
Um, but we noticed when we rolled out custom widgets, a lot of customers were adding borders to buttons. They were adding icons to buttons. Um, this is very similar to the existing button functionality of a widget, but sort of just adds a little bit extra to it. We sort of see product enhancements as very small tweaks. Um, and the example of borders on buttons or icons on buttons was such a good use case that we actually then turned it into a feature of the platform. The next main use case we notice that customers use custom widgets for is what we call stop gaps. Uh, these are usually larger pieces of functionality that a user wants to build out, and it's easier to do so in a custom widget than it would be in the app editor. Example I have here on the slide is a number pad. Looks pretty much just like an old cell phone used to. It has uh, all of the numbers plus the clear and enter option. This is something that you could, in theory, build out with buttons and triggers inside the app editor, but it's much quicker to do so with a custom widget, as well as this is something we'd love to have functionality to do easily within app editor in the future, but we're just not there yet. So number pad, you can set sort of input any text you want. Uh, you have a trigger that could essentially emit an event when you hit enter, when you hit clear, configure it however you want. There's a number of examples on Tulip Library for a lot of these use cases, such as we have another widget increment or a step-by-step -step menu. And the third main use case of custom widgets we want to talk about today is these uniquely custom logic, visualization, and features that realistically Tulip will probably not have on their roadmap anytime soon. So a lot of these could be visualizations that are very powerful, could help your operators when they're running the apps, but are very difficult to generalize for other customer use cases. Another could be if you have custom parsing logic with any sort of input or output that's hard to do in any sort of other function, you can write that in JavaScript and run it through a custom widget. You can see here on the slide, there's an example of a Tulip engineer actually built this widget. It takes in a MQTT broker, and you can configure that broker URL, the different topic, and the message you want to post to it, and it can just send messages. And under the hood, there's a lot of parsing logic that's going on here, but what the user just sees is pressing a button and sending a message and seeing it processed nicely. So custom widgets, in summary, are a really powerful tool that could expand the capabilities that your app builders are doing with their day-to-day -day applications. A few things to look out for when writing and using custom widgets is that Tulip apps are not designed to run multiple iframes. So if you have, let's say, 20 custom widgets on a single step, you could run into some performance problems. Another thing just to be cautious of when writing custom widgets is that you are writing the way that this code is going to be executed. Tulip is not performance testing on it. So be cautious and wary that the code and the JavaScript that you're putting into a custom widget is performant and written well, such that it doesn't affect your application in any other way. OK, and next up is connectors. Connectors are an interface for connecting to external systems. Within a Tulip app, interact with APIs and SQL databases in real time. Now, this is a no-code tool, but it requires some specialized knowledge, like understanding of basic networking, HTTP, REST, or SQL. The goal of connectors is to get data within an application right when you need it. Let's walk through an example. Here we have an operator who's in trouble. Their machine is down, and their supervisor is nowhere to be found. They're already using Tulip, so their physical and digital and on is red. But we could be even more effective at unblocking operations. A quick thinking process engineer has an idea. In the existing machine terminal app, we add a flow to send to a message on downtime. You can see the trigger here making a call to the Microsoft Teams using our built-in connector. Here's an example of a single connector function. This operates using parameters sent from the application. In this example, there are no outputs but if there were, you'd define them below. You can see at the top, there's the URL. There are the inputs from the application. And on the right, you build the request body. This is the no-code part of building a connector. And voila, supervisor is alerted and can immediately react. This connector, along with sample apps, 
is available for download in our library. Let's have a more complex example. Here's a connection to SAP or any ERP or MES for that matter. An operator is running a work instruction terminal. They scan a barcode of their work order and submit it. The connector function runs with that work order ID and pulls information back to display it to that operator in real time. Here's a zoom in on that connector function. We can see a connection to the SAP sandbox at the top, the input of the barcode scan labeled here as planned order, and the data being returned to the app. With that principle, you can now transact in real time for all sorts of information, like partial batch completion updates or defect reporting. In summary, a few guidelines and roadblocks to be aware of. Firstly, Tulip is not middleware. If you're using Tulip to transform data between two systems, you're probably not on the right track. Keep connectors focused on sending relevant information to apps and back to external systems. Start small, then expand. Get IT involved. Prep them on the value proposition of Tulip. Align on the goals of the projects before making requests to access systems. Identify sources of truth and don't be greedy. Only transact data that's needed. Keep apps fast and light and don't tax your other business systems. You can see the library for additional content built by Tulip to connect to many systems that you may already have. All right, so the next piece of low-code functionality within Tulip is our Tulip APIs. There's three main use cases we want to highlight here today. The first being Tulip table APIs, the second being machine APIs, and the third being utility APIs. So the Tulip table APIs. Tulip tables are a spreadsheet-based Postgres-backed data structure within Tulip. Once some data is in a Tulip table, it can then interact with the rest of the platform, whether that's an app, maybe a connector, maybe uh, automation. And the way that you can use and interact with the API can be just directly, or you can do sort of third-party tools such as Boomi, Multisoft, their SAP has a one as well. And when you're working with a Tulip table API, there's two main functions that we see people wanting to do. The first being writing to a Tulip table and the second being reading from the Tulip table. So an example of wanting to write to a Tulip table is maybe at the beginning of a shift, you as a company have a bunch of work orders that you have on your own system that you want to then input into Tulip to then be run and accessed via Tulip apps. You could do that via a post request, um, send it to a Tulip table, and then all of your applications can read that data and interact with it as needed. At the end of the shift, you could then export all of the data as well. Maybe the applications have manipulated in some way, and then this is your way of getting it back into your system. So to use and interact with the Tulip API, all you need to do is define the data model yourself within Tulip. Um, this could be with columns, what kind of data they store, um, whether something is required or not, and then the API functionality will be accessible once that table exists. Um, and then you just can tap into that, call the API based on the table ID you have, and you're good to go. Next, we're going to talk about machine API. Despite the name, this is event-based messaging that's not just for CNC machines. Event-based messaging can use, be used for devices, machines, or even alerts. Utilize your existing systems, low-code tools, PLCs, et cetera, to integrate existing shop floor devices with Tulip without needing to duplicate effort. Within the application, you can define a machine, its state and its attributes. For example, weight for a scale, torque values for a tightening tool, or feed rate for a CNC. Then use the machine API to send real-time updates to those attributes to Tulip. So the last use case for APIs within Tulip could be for utility functions. We have APIs right now that can list all of your apps. We have APIs that can create a user. And these would be helpful for managing your Tulip instance. For example, you could create a bunch of users through a script if you need to create a bunch all at once. Or if you are listing all of your applications, you could then, we are about to roll out a new API to let you write to an application for its name. So you could list all your applications, 
loop through them in a script of some sort and then maybe add a prefix to all of the applications if you want to rename them because you're moving them or renaming them for whatever functional reason. These are just ways you could utilize these and they could really help you speed up the organization of all of your applications and users within Tulip. So in summary, for tables, do combine connectors and table APIs for optimal systems integrations. For some data, you may want to bulk load into Tulip, others you want in real time. Use those both effectively in tandem. Design table structures with apps and complementary systems in mind. Don't treat Tulip tables as a data lake. And be wary of duplicating source of truth data between Tulip and another system. Rather, choose one and have both systems keep that data in sync. For machines, consider using existing integrations to get data into Tulip quickly and cost-effectively. If you have a PLC that's already in place and connected to a test rig, for example, if that PLC can hit a Tulip endpoint, do that. Another tip, your existing middle flare platforms like Boomi, MuleSoft, Homegrown, et cetera, and enterprise service buses can plug right into these standard APIs. Lastly, we have Node-RED. Node-RED is a low-code tool based on Node.js. It runs everywhere, including out of the box on our edge devices. Use Node-RED for machine monitoring, data collection, or specifically turning JSON into a CSV, loading it onto a shared drive for your 15-year-old printer. All very common use cases of Node-RED. You can see here on the right, there's an example of its click and drag interface, including using the aforementioned Tulip Machine API. Node-RED is even easier to use when you connect it with Tulip authored nodes. Connect your Node-RED flows to Tulip Machine attributes, Tulip tables, and authenticate on any Node-RED running platform. On Tulip OS, so on our edge devices, you can also use Tulip tags, which is an even easier way to send machine data from Tulip to edge device. Here's an example. Use GPIO on an Edge I.O. to monitor part count. Here we have a Tulip Edge I.O. that's running a Node-RED flow to monitor a pin, filter for that pin being up, and then update the Tulip tag for that specific part count. That Tulip tag is reading out to our machine API where it updates machine attribute that is then being read by one or many Tulip applications. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We hope you learned something valuable with these examples and try some of them out as a way to extend Tulip into a low-code platform. You can find additional information at Tulip University, our support site, and community. Thanks, everyone.